Hi guys, thanks very much for taking the time this evening to come and join me. I think I've had a look, the technology is working and I've had a look on the website and there's about 25, 30 people there at the moment, which is good going. Often people take a little while just to filter in, so I'll maybe give uh, 30 seconds. I am going to start just in one sec. Let me just get presentation going. So the title for tonight is Teenage Angst. It's really just to go through lots of different pathologies, cover lots of different things, and then we'll pick some particular ones in a little bit more detail that tend to happen in that adolescent group with regards to their knees. A bit of background about me. If I've not met any of you guys before, Clearly, I'm not from the South Coast, trained in Scotland, went to university up in Aberdeen, originally from Glasgow, and came down to the South Coast, clearly because it's awesome. Internationally fellowship trained, I'm a major trauma consultant and pure knee surgeon in University Hospital Southampton. My specialist interest is patellar instability, partial resurfacing, which is not really relevant for this, and sports injury and reconstruction. And that stems both the adult population and the paediatric population, starting from about 10 years old. It's incredible the ages that kids are having sports types injuries, ligament type injuries, and we'll go through some of those pathologies tonight. Knee pain in the teenage population is really, really common. A lot of it is overuse. And I think that term is kind of misleading. That implies that somehow you're doing too much exercise. I'm not sure that encouraging our, our kids and teenagers to do exercise, you could do too much. But a lot of people's schedules now, and I know my own kids, tend to have a week packed with lots of different activities and sports. We want to give them the opportunity to try everything. Kids, particularly mine, seem to, any chance they get, at all to have a tennis racket, a bat, a ball, get to run, jump in the water, they want to do it. The, the level that these children are encouraged to participate in these sports at gets higher and higher and higher and it becomes much more serious much more quickly than I think it did in the past. They start to creep into doing adult type activities, things that children wouldn't have normally been involved in in the past, they now have an opportunity to do that. Acute macro trauma is frequent. It's not really what we're talking about tonight. That's sort of things like broken bones, um, direct trauma because of sport. It's the more subtle things that I want to discuss today. So overuse type injuries, it tends to be because they've got a sudden increase in the intensity of the exercise that they're doing. They might have been doing regular running at PE at school or football at school but suddenly decide to join mum or dad doing a park run at 11, 12, 14, decide that they want to train for a half marathon because they've seen it on social media, etc. And it's that sudden jump from doing what they're normally conditioned to doing to something extra. And that extra impact and, and intensity of that exercise suddenly becomes a problem for them. It's the duration and the volume of the physical activity that they're doing. Often that they're maybe not completely prepared for it. So they go in 110% into the half marathon, go on a 10K with dad, haven't really done much specific conditioning for that specific thing. They're not normally a long distance runner and they go straight into it and do too much too quickly. Poor training techniques. So they may be not getting professional training in whatever they're doing. They're maybe doing it themselves. They're maybe starting a sport with a sibling and that sort of training and, and prehab and uh, warming up doesn't really happen in those circumstances, which can cause problems. Inappropriate equipment for the sport. Again, even silly things. Kids grow really, really quickly and keeping up with them and constantly buying them kit and doesn't really happen. I know myself uh, with ours, you get a hockey stick, it gets handed down to the next one. It might be a bit big, it might be a bit small. You think, oh, that's fine, they'll manage it. But the impact of maybe using that hockey stick and having to, to run in a different way if it's too short might have an impact. And if that's continued over a longer period of time, can potentially cause them pain and problems. There are also, outside of 
that overuse and, and really just increasing intensity problem of uh, 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 injuries in children, we want to look more specific at the kind of intrinsic causes of some of those pain, uh, some of those problems. I've divided it up. I'm going to talk about the anterior knee, and then we'll talk about the medial knee and the lateral knee, and the different differential diagnoses that I would have in my mind when somebody comes in saying, you know, I've got real pain, and they draw a circle around their kneecap, indicating that that's the area of, of pain or problem. So some of these terms you may have heard, some of them you won't have. Hoffa, fat pad impingement. I really don't like a lot of the words and the, the things that we use to describe these diagnoses. A lot of them, as you see when we go through things, actually have no bearing on the pathology that's there at all. Um, the Hoffa's fat pad is really just the fat pad within the knee. Um, now, I think I've got a model behind me of a knee. Um, and you don't have space in your knee, you don't have air, and the Hoffa fat pad is really just the fat that fills in this gap in between underneath the patella tendon and into the notch of the knee. That's held into the notch with what's called the ligamentum mucosum, and that just acts as a tether so that that fat pad stays where it's meant to. Now, normally that's a very dynamic structure. You bend and move your knee, that should bend and slip and slide and glide with your knee so it doesn't become caught between anything. Depending on the makeup of the patient, the alignment of the patient's leg, what sport they're doing, what position their leg and their foot is in, potentially, if that's a repetitive thing, that fat pad can rub in an inappropriate place, you get inflammation and pain and discomfort, and that's often quite easily seen on an MRI scan. That's not a diagnosis that you can necessarily make on clinical examination. There isn't a specific or sensitive test that you can do to identify that. You're just thinking anterior knee pain. These are some of the diagnoses or some of the words that might be thrown out or that you'll see on an MRI report if they have one. Idiopathic anterior knee pain. That's exactly what I was talking about. These are the sort of terms that sound very dramatic. And you're explaining that to a patient, they're like, oh, that's a, a really interesting diagnosis. What does that mean? And idiopathic, actually, idiopathic, my spelling's dreadful. Idiopathic essentially means we don't really know. So that's not really a diagnosis at all. That's just saying you have some knee pain and we don't know why. When you look up the literature with regards to this term idiopathic anterior knee pain, it's really a diagnosis of exclusion. So once you've, once you've excluded everything else that you can think of, then you can label a patient with idiopathic anterior knee pain. On its own, it's not particularly helpful. I think it's not that they don't have a problem. It's just that you haven't identified their problem or their problem is very subtle and they may have slight maltracking of their patellae. They might have some chondromalacia that you can't see in an MRI scan. So I don't think it's a really helpful term, but it ultimately is explaining or describing a patient that has ongoing anterior knee pain, but doesn't have gross pathology that's potentially going to be a problem. So in a sense, that diagnosis is reassuring and one that you should encourage patients to continue their normal activities and really kind of work through. Multipartite patellae is where your patella is in more than one piece, and that's not because of trauma, it's the way that you're, um, you develop. We're going to focus on that one a wee bit later, and I'll go into a bit more detail with that, so I'm not going to talk too much more about that just now. OGS is Osgood Schlatter disease, and I'll be honest, I put OGS because I'm not entirely sure how to spell it properly. I never know how to spell it when I write it down. It's another one of these um, eponymous terms for something that, again, is not particularly helpful. It's one of those diagnoses if you give to a patient or you say that they have it, they, they look really very worried because it sounds like a dreadful disease um, when actually it's uh, attraction apophysitis, which means that the, the attachment of, a, of the tendon onto the patella, uh, onto the tibial tuberosity, um, has micro trauma and again I'm going to focus on that because it's one that's discussed a lot it's really very common it's something that parents are aware of and have heard of uh, and often have concerns over so I'm going to go into a bit more detail about that OCD is osteochondritis desiccans another dreadful term that actually doesn't really apply to 
the pathology that causes this. And we actually don't really know what the pathology that causes um, an osteochondral uh, uh, lesion within the knee that becomes detached. Again, a really, really common thing and something I want to go into a bit more detail and we'll focus after uh, some of these slides. Patellar stress fractures, that is an overuse uh, injury. Ultimately, if you have a repetitive uh, a strain on the patella or the patella tendon, lots of impact, uh, you can develop a stress fracture, just like you can develop a stress fracture anywhere else within your skeleton. You know, it's the same sort of pathology that you'd perhaps get when you have a soldier who's marching repetitively and constantly, that they end up with microtrauma within a bone that ultimately fractures, causes inflammation, pain, um, and problems. Patellar tendinopathies, again, are these overuse or is it a physiological thing? We don't really understand. There are certain patients that are very susceptible to having tendinopathies. There are lots of people that do regular, constant, repetitive exercise like marathon running, and it's not a dose-dependent problem. So it's not as if everybody that runs over 20 miles two or three times a week suddenly becomes has a tendinopathy. Clearly, there's something within your makeup or your uh, physiology that puts you at risk of having a tendinopathy, but they are related to increasing activities. Or if you have a, tendon, a tendinopathy, the more you do on it, the more pain that you get, the less light it likely it is to resolve. And when you reduce that exercise back down, the tendinopathies will often go away. Now you can get that in different places. Really any uh, tendon that has stress on it from a muscle can ultimately have this chronic inflammation within it that causes chronic uh, pain, uh, particularly on stressing that particular muscle. So it's not isolated to the patella tendon. Uh, it's something that's relatively common. You can get it in the quads tendon as well. There's an increased potential risk of rupture. Again, very unlikely in the pediatric population, but something is the, you become an adult, tends to be the source of most uh, uh, ruptures of tendons, whether that's your Achilles, quads, or your patellar tendon. The diagnosis of that ultimately can be a clinical one. You often can feel that there's thickening, there's direct uh, pain, discomfort, and tension over the patellar tendon or whichever tendons involve. Um, an MRI scan is probably the next step to make sure that it's not something else that's ultimately causing this problem. And you see the very um, obvious increased signal uptake in keeping with that inflammation that's at the insertion of the tendon. Treatment generally is conservative, very rarely that it would ever require any surgical intervention, particularly in the pediatric population. It can linger and it can take a long time. Part of the problem both in the pediatric population and in adults with any kind of tendinopathy is that they generally happen because somebody is doing an excessive amount of exercise or a, a, an overly repetitive uh, schedule of exercise. That person that does that, it's very difficult to get them to reduce that or to stop that exercise. So asking somebody who's been training for a marathon and saying, you know, you can't run for the next three months, you're gonna have to find something else to do. They generally are not fantastically compliant with that. And the pathology tends to linger on and it can last up to years and patients tend not to find that acceptable and are seeking different management strategies and potential treatments to try and get rid of it uh, rather than reducing their exercise level. Eccentric stretching, physio reduction of your activities, symptom control with painkillers are the mainstay and time, unfortunately. It tends to burn itself out over the course of months or years. There are not very many people that I've ever met that have had lifelong patellar tendonitis, so it does go away, uh, but patients tend to want you to do something to make it go away faster. If it's been lingering and it's really chronic, some of the different strategies for, for trying to cause that micro trauma that we need to do to encourage the neovascularization or bringing all those healing uh, factors into that area to try and get rid of the chronic inflammation that's there. So, Shockwave therapy is one that's used and we have access to in Southampton General, which is generally quite good. It's not invasive. It doesn't particularly increase the potential risk of uh, rupture of the tendon. It has to take quite a few sessions for that to, to work. 
and it's not particularly pleasant. So in the paediatric population, it's not something that's done very regularly because it's not really an acceptable thing from a patient point of view. The other one that um, we do in very uh, uh, chronic ones that really are not settling and you should do something surgical is a procedure called topaz, which is a small open procedure and we use an RF wand. So it's a small, tiny tip the size of a, a needle that uh, essentially heats up and you make a grid um, of little uh, piercings in the, the tendon where it attaches. And again, all of that's doing is causing a very controlled micro trauma to that insertion to try and bring all those healing factors to get it to settle. Um, on the kind of newer side of things, there's certainly some evidence that uh, PRP type injections or protein rich plasma um, injections into a, a, a tendinopathy can help, but the evidence is really still pretty slim. Um, and it's not something that I would encourage, and certainly not in the paediatric population, but something that may become more popular in the future. Prepatellar bursitis, that, you know, used to be called housemaid's knee. You see it in the adult population and people that are like carpet fitters, etc. people that spend a lot of time on their knees. That's the area where the skin has to glide over any kind of joint. There's a specialized surface underneath that called your a bursa, um, and that can become inflamed and very tender and painful, and you can get secondary infection on top of that, and um, that then can be a real problem. That tends to be a bit more obvious to see. So it's superficial, you tend to feel a kind of boggy swelling that's quite well defined. It tends to come in an acute fashion. It has a history of spending time on their knees or there's something has happened. Um, you will often see some erythema and warmth in the front of the knee. What you definitely don't want to ever do is if somebody has a large fluid collection there is to stick a needle in and try and aspirate it. The potential risk of infection is, is there. Secondary, there's a possibility of creating a sinus that just doesn't go away. You do not need to draw fluid from that. The body will resolve that over time as the inflammation settles. If there's any concern at all that they're syst systemically unwell or there's evidence of infection with a raised fever um, or tracking cellulitis that's, that's around the rest of the joint, that's something that needs um, an acute and urgent uh, review by orthopedics. It's often very difficult to tell the difference um, between uh, a really good going bursitis that's inflamed versus one that's infected. So if there's any concern at all, that's something that needs to be dealt with relatively quickly. Quadriceps tendonitis, exactly the same as what we're talking about with the patella tendonitis, except it's the insertion of the quads into the superior pole of your patella. Sindig larsen johansson syndrome, another fantastic name of something that describes nothing. Sindig larsen johansson syndrome is very similar to osgood schlatter in that it's the same, but rather than where the patella tendon attaches into the tibial tubercle, it's where the patella tendon attaches into the uh, distal pole of the patella and you get that traction apophysitis where you get inflammation, almost like a small fracture and, inf uh, and, um, and pain. And I'll go through the Osgood Slatters in a wee minute um, and it's really just applicable with that, but in a slightly different position. So, not as many here, but intrinsic causes that you would think possibly as a differential diagnosis when somebody has medial pain around their knee. In between the joint, you have the meniscus. Clearly, if they've had a twisting type trauma, they've got their history, will tell you it before you will ever have to put your hands on the patient that they've potentially got a meniscal, repair, a meniscal, meniscal tear. They will have potential fluid within the joint uh, because of the inflammation or even blood within the joint if it's a more significant trauma. The medial meniscal tears are important to identify. If there's any concern at all that that's happened, it's important to make sure that they're either referred on or they have an MRI scan of their knee. It's not something that necessarily can be treated with physio. If a child has a significant meniscal tear, be that medial or lateral, there's a possibility of that being able to be repaired, um, which is not quite as common in the, the, the older population, but in the pediatric population, to be able to maintain and fix that meniscus is absolutely vital. So if anybody has a history that's in keeping with a significant meniscal tear, they need urgent uh, referral, they need an MRI scan, and identification as to what degree that meniscus is torn. 
It's also quite common that if you have a meniscal tear or an injury that would cause a potential meniscal tear, there's likely to be some other injury within the knee, be that with the surface cartilage of the joint or possibly a ligament. So an MRI scan is important not only to identify the meniscal repair, but just to make sure that there isn't any other pathology within the knee that could be needing uh, treatment. Osteochondritis desiccans, that term implies that you have some kind of drying out of the cartilage or something like that. And it's really just an eponymous name that's been given to this process that we don't really understand why it happens. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail um, about that. And I think there's a few myths that have kind of gone around with regards to osteochondritis, and I'll try and clear up some of them. Plica or aplica is another one of these things, a term that is thrown around very regularly um, as a significant source of pain within children's knees and some adults' knees. And if I'm absolutely honest, they do exist and there are some circumstances that people have quite a large plica, which is the uh, uh, <clears throat> a part of the lining of the, the joint, the synovial lining, where you have bands of that uh, tissue that can potentially impinge or rub on a part of the joint. To, to the degree that they're going to cause pain is incredibly rare. They're a common feature. They're normal uh, within the knee. And I think if somebody has a significant disabling pain or there's something going on with their knee and it's being put down to a plica, I would question that diagnosis. It's not something that generally causes significant problems. It's generally not something that would cause somebody to not be able to participate in sport or have something that limits them in their life. So a plica, although they do exist, I think is something that's very much overstated. It's something that is almost impossible to diagnose clinically. You will see lots of tests about how to check for a plica and people that will absolutely convince you that they can feel a plica with their finger. Um, I do not believe that. Um, it is incredibly unlikely that you'll be able to diagnose a, pl a plica clinically and it's something even on an MRI scan or imaging really doesn't <coughs> show up. And the only time that I, in all the years that I've been doing these, really could diagnose a plica is when I'm physically looking at one doing an arthroscopy. Um, and it's only at that point that you can see it dynamically moving and potentially causing a problem. And even then, I still am not absolutely convinced as to how much of an impact the plica is actually having on the overall problem. It tends to be associated with other abnormal pathology within the knee. So just be very cautious with that diagnosis of a plica. Pez, Pez anserinus, bursa, again, nice legacy from everybody obviously speaking Greek and Latin um, in medicine. The Pez anserinus, it relates to what's called the goose's foot, um, where your hamstring tendons attach onto the anteromedial aspect of the tibia. Anywhere, again, where you've, you've got uh, structures that need to dynamically move as a joint moves and have to be able to slip and slide and glide over each other, have that specialized bursal tissue uh, with some fluid to allow that to happen without pain or discomfort or inflammation. If somebody is doing more than they should or are very overactive, you can get inflammation at the insertion of the hamstring tendons onto that part of your tibia um, or fluid build up round about that that can be very tender. It's easy to confuse that with the same insertion of the uh, medial collateral ligament. They are both essentially over each other. So it's quite tough to completely diagnose a pes bursa. Again, it's one of these things that you can have a suspicion of. Certainly you can have um, some idea on clinical examination that could be something that's going on. But ultimately an MRI scan of the knee will show you that increased uptake. It will show you that fluid around the hamstring tendons, particularly semimembranosus, which leads on to the semimembranosus bursa. They're kind of interlinked with each other and often uh, very similar in uh, uh, presentation. It's not something that you tend to treat in any other way other than conservatively with rest and symptom control, uh, but <clears throat> it's something to be aware of as a possible source. If you've got somebody who's got it, it's really recalcitrant, it's really not going away, then the possibility of something like a steroid type injection just to kickstart that anti-inflammatory uh, process around it can be useful. The other thing that I haven't put in this, but I've seen quite a few times is folk that have got hamstring tendons that kind of snap or click. Um, 
it tends to be in quite slim, skinny people. Um, and it's just something else to be aware of. It's incredibly rare. Um, and I've only had to operate on one person that's had that, but it was really quite disabling. And they literally, every time they moved their knee, had this band ping, and you could see their hamstring tendons click back and forwards. And ultimately, we had to ham harvest their hamstrings as if we were doing an ACL reconstruction. And within two or three years, their hamstrings actually regenerated, but uh, were much more stable. So it's a really odd but interesting uh, case. The lateral side, again, meniscal tears, but much more common on the lateral side is that you could potentially have what's called a discoid meniscus. Again, this is a developmental thing. If you've ever uh, looked at meniscus or the anatomy of a meniscus, it looks like a, a, a moon or a semi-lunar uh, cartilage is what they used to be called, um, <clears throat> with an attachment at the front and the back and then ultimately uh, attached to the, the lining of the joint and the rim of the joint, stabilizing them. The discoid meniscus is one that hasn't really retracted. Instead of being C-shaped, it's basically D-shaped. So it, it really doesn't, um, it has a center. And the problem is that that meniscal tissue is sitting between the two surfaces of the femur and the tibia. So you can imagine it's like having a rug um, underneath the car tires and you try to accelerate off. What's happening is you're shearing the, the, the structure that's sitting in between the joint. And over time, just by... Uh, constant friction uh, and traction on that it ultimately can tear um, which then causes a mechanical block and pain and discomfort in the patient's knee. I've seen discoid meniscus that have lasted for years and the oldest person I've uh, had to deal with one was about 55 so that lady had a full discoid meniscus that she spent her entire life in between her tibia and her femur and had been sporty, had done everything she wanted to do, and unluckily had a slip and a fall, and it was only at that point that she managed to tear her discoid meniscus. If you have a tear of the meniscus, or if you have a large discoid that's causing pain, really the treatment for that is probably ultimately surgical, where we have to, what's called, saucerize it, but trimming that bit in the middle, reshaping it to try and make it C-shaped. It's never the best, because ultimately, because it's been developmental, that's had an impact on the shape of the, the, the articular surface of the femur and of the tibia. And often you'll find that the two joints are not completely as congruous as they should be because that discoid has been in between. But ultimately, if you've got a mechanical block and a tear of that, you really have no other choice. The next one's the iliotibial band friction syndrome. This may be something that never really gets to orthopedics and is dealt with by uh, physio. It's not something I've seen very much of and really just in the research for this tonight to uh, mention. Again, it's a bit of an overuse um, injury where the iliotibial band, which comes down the lateral side of your leg with an ultimate attachment onto Gerdes tubercle, which is um, over the lateral aspect of the tibia at the very proximal side, can rub over the lateral uh, femoral condyle and cause some pain and discomfort. Ultimately, the reason I probably don't know very much about it is that it never pretty much has uh, surgical intervention. I've never operated one. I've never seen one being operated on. So the mainstay is conservative management, symptom control, and physio and stretching for that. Meniscal tears otherwise, that's just from direct macro trauma. Popeteus tendonitis, it's back in that same category that we can group everything together where a tendon attaches to a, mus a bony attachment and if that's overstretched or overused, get inflammation, pain and discomfort. Again, that is not something that ever requires surgical intervention and is ultimately about symptom control and retraining and education. Saphenous nerve entrapment. Again, something that I discovered pretty much on organizing this um, uh, PowerPoint. The saphenous nerve runs down the medial side of the leg and can often uh, cause uh, uh, so it, it, it supplies the uh, sensation, cutaneous sen sensation over the lateral aspect of the leg. It can be damaged for lots of different reasons in trauma. It can cause you some ongoing numbness or have a neuroma that then causes abnormal sensation and pain. Spontaneous entrapment is very rare. It's not something I've ever really seen. Uh, and ultimately, uh, with neurophysiology, you might be able to diagnose it, but um, it's not something otherwise that I, I would particularly spend an awful lot of time worrying about. One more is the hypermobile lateral meniscus. 
So this is a really, really difficult one. Um, and it's a group of patients who will often have been passed from pillar to post to different um, orthopedic people. They'll have had multiple admissions to the emergency department with a locked knee. They then go through the standard system. Somebody will organize an MRI scan and that MRI scan will look normal. They'll be told that there's nothing wrong with their knee and then they'll have a further episode of locking and so the cycle keeps going round. What is happening is that they have what looks like a normal meniscus and they may well have a completely normal meniscus. But on the lateral side of your knee, unlike the medial side where the meniscus is attached all the way around uh, the periphery, the lateral meniscus has what's called the popliteal hiatus. So the popliteus tendon passes behind the lateral meniscus and there's a small gap where the popliteus tendon goes through and the, the meniscus isn't attached to that. Now, there's normally uh, an acceptable amount of mobility that your meniscus needs in order to be that dynamic structure that it is. But there's what's called meniscal fascicles, which are almost, if you imagine, like little guy ropes that are holding the meniscus onto the, the edge of the tibial plateau, onto the edge of the joint and around the popliteus tendon, if they are damaged, then the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus becomes more mobile than it should be. And it allows it to actually be able to sublux anteriorly like a bucket handle tear of a meniscus so that it gets trapped within the joint, locks the patient's knee, but then when they maneuver it, it will sublux back to where it should be. And when you get an MRI scan, look relatively normal. It's an incredibly difficult thing to diagnose, even on an MR. You have to have a very specific concern that that's what it might be and speak to a radiologist, a musculoskeletal radiologist, and say, are the meniscal fascicles intact? I think it's possibly a hypermobile lateral meniscus. Can you look specifically at that? And even in those circumstances, it can be very difficult, or if not impossible, to actually see those. And it becomes much more clear when you do an arthroscopy looking for it that when you hook the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus and pull that it can completely sublux anteriorly and now that's something that needs meniscal repair to reattach that and give it the stability that it needs but it can be a real difficult challenge for some patients to get to that point where they're really being exhausted through the system getting very frustrated um, and often not believed um, so psychologically that can be incredibly hard uh, for patients. So it's just something to keep in the back of your mind if you've seen somebody like that. So kind of going back a bit and, and focusing on a few of the things that we talked about and going back to this, this diagnosis of exclusion, the idiopathic anterior knee pain. Activity related anterior knee pain is one of the most common causes of pain in adolescents. Doing my paediatric clinic, it's probably one or two people every clinic come in with essentially anterior knee pain without an obvious pathology or an obvious trauma. Um, you can see that from one of the studies that looked through this and looked at the etiology of it, that there's about 30% of the adult adolescent population will at some point have idiopathic anterior knee pain. It's more common in girls. Uh, and it's quite significantly higher than the number in uh, boys. I'm not entirely sure why that is, whether that's to do with the kind of earlier growth spurts and the, the more maturity that girls have when they kind of start growing, that it maybe presents faster. But it seems that it's much more common in girls. A lot of anterior knee problems um, are definitely higher in girls. Patellar instability is much higher. Um, whether that's to do with uh, the, the natural rotation that... Um, that women have or the fact that they're far more likely to be valgus which increases their Q angle and um, has an impact on patellar tracking that could be something to do with it but it's not entirely uh, clear. The most consistent factor leading to it tends to be that they're overloading and again I don't like that term of overloading because that implies that they're doing more than they should and nobody has a certain level of activity and there's too much and not enough. Well, there's definitely not enough but there's certainly not an absolute too much but if you've got somebody who is doing a lot of activity and has anterior knee pain, that's probably the biggest thing that's, that's causing that. And they may not have a specific pathology. It might just be that it's just a bit too much for their skeleton, their physiology. Malalignment, abnormal tracking of the patella, I think is a really big role. It may be that that abnormal uh, patella tracking or 
rotation of the limb or their cue angle may just not be particularly dramatic and it might be difficult to necessarily measure that on a scan but it's those slight subtle abnormalities or people on the edge of that normal distribution curve for uh, the rotation or the the depth of the groove of the patella etc that with a, with too much exercise or lots of exercise suddenly starts to manifest itself with anterior knee pain so they may not have a true pathology that needs something surgically done or something changed but it might be enough that given uh, an intense level of exercise suddenly it manifests itself with discomfort these are sort of cute, uh, the contributing factors that we discussed on so abnormal cue angle and that's really just if you draw a line down your quads to where the patellar groove is and where your patella tendon attaches onto that you kind of want to be in a straight line so that when your quads pulls your kneecaps moving in a straight line and everything's running in one way as soon as you introduce an angle to that if you think back to maths in school you've got vectors and a resultant force that's trying to pull your kneecap off laterally which then overloads that lateral facet and then drives that whole pain thing um, all of these ten, all of the rest of these, if you have a quick look through at the beginning, tend to all be about alignment and the way that you're kind of built. And again, you know, valgus knees, varus knees, hyperpronation, it's all being on the edge of that distribution curve. Um, hypermobility, hyperlaxity, again, there's not a huge amount of evidence to show that that ultimately causes you pain and discomfort. Um, but you do tend to see more people with patellar instability and patellar problems and anterior knee pain who are hypermobile than not so there definitely is a link there somewhere uh, patellar chondromalacia which is really just softening of the the patellar cartilage almost like early degenerate change within the knee that's kind of spontaneous um, is that the chicken or the egg is that there because they've got an odd maltracking problem that's then ultimately caused them to have problems with their cartilage that's equal pain or is it the other way around and it's really very difficult to know investigation MRI is really there to exclude other pathology it's not a diagnosis that you could possibly give somebody without having some kind of imaging so absolutely do not label somebody with idiopathic anterior knee pain unless you've done an MRI scan you know last thing you want to do is call them idiopathic anterior knee pain to find that they have an osteosarcoma of their distal femur do an MRI scan it is or refer them to somebody that's going to do an MRI scan or at least get an x-ray before you do anything if you have concerns treatment Activity modification, you don't need to completely rest these patients. <clears throat> I've seen kids that have been told by different people that, you know, no rugby, no PE, no nothing for the next year. Um, and these children are not participating in school, not being part of their peer group, not part of a uh, conversation. Impacts on their mental health, absolutely terrible thing to do to somebody who's young to tell them that they're not allowed to basically run around in the playground with their friends. Terrible. I would rather that they had anterior knee pain and involve themselves in school that's not going to do them any harm after an MRI scan than telling them not to do anything at all. So that's really not a good idea. Analgesia, if they need it, symptom control to allow them to, to continue moving and using their muscles normally. Reduce impact and stress and introducing closed chain type activities are really important. So getting them in a pool, getting them on a bike is much better than having them running around if you have to kind of choose activities that they enjoy. You know, rehabilitation exercise, kind of leave all this stuff up to the, the physio guys, but flexibility, strength and endurance is really, really important. And focusing on uh, kind of balancing up their muscles so that you're not focusing on one more than the other. Flipping things to Osgood Schlatter's disease. Again, we'll kind of buzz through some of these a little bit quickly. I don't want to keep you guys too long. Um, it's an overuse injury, traction apophysitis. Again, fancy word, basically meaning the growth plate that extends down to the tibial tuberosity where the patella tendon attaches gets pulled because of the activities that they're doing and you basically get micro trauma a small fracture where you pull a little bit of that tendon off that growth plate and then new bone forms and you get this kind of common slightly bulky tibial tubercle that's tender and painful to touch an x-ray looks quite typical of that extra bone that's been laid down often have like a little ossicle within uh, the patella tendon itself most common in boys <clears throat> higher in athletes than non and that's presumably because they're putting more stress and having more traction on the patellar tendon ultimately making it more likely that it's going to kind of pull a bit off so 21% versus 4% it's quite a significant difference 
rapid growth and increased physical activity can can predispose to that and that makes perfect sense when you think about it suddenly they're growing super fast that means that the not only are they potentially getting taller and putting more tension on the structures that are there but also the um, the physis is most active and probably at its weakest and is more likely to have uh, a trauma uh, when you're doing those activities that then ultimately causes the, the inflammation. It's not something that's a problem. It's not something that's going to become something else. It's not something that puts them at risk of pulling off the patella tendon. It's more that it's uncomfortable and it's there. It is very much associated with the age and obviously you need to have an open physis for that to happen so you can imagine that girls are more mature than boys in every sense even as grown-ups but in particularly with this so you can see the age ranges that it's most appropriate and makes sense with that it's often uh, not bilateral but it can be in some patients probably about 20 to 30 percent you will get some bulky swelling it's not swelling so much of the soft tissues but just that the tibial tubercle is more prominent because they've had this trauma, it's like a small fracture that's that's healing and you get the appropriate information around that. And again, the x-ray showing what we were talking about uh, before. Treatment is universally conservative. Decrease some of the activity so they're not so sore. It's really just symptom control. Uh, it can last for years. It tends to settle when the bone uh, physis uh, fuses. Uh, it's not something that happens in adults. If you've got an x-ray of somebody whose spices are closed and completely fused and have significant pain and discomfort, etc., cannot give them a diagnosis of osteoarthritis. So this is a diagnosis that's purely for folk that have um, open spices. Like I said before, it doesn't increase the risk of uh, avulsion. And Sindig Larsen, your Hansen syndrome, is the same pathology, but for the distal pole of the patella. It's probably less common or it maybe has uh, less of uh, an impact and is less prominent and obvious, so therefore it maybe doesn't present as often. Uh, but uh, again, something that can be treated conservatively. Osteochondritis desiccans. So it's delamination ultimately is a kind of end stage of the articular cartilage, localized necrosis of the subchondral bone. So you get what looks almost like the size of a, a smarty or something, of bone underneath the articular cartilage that it, it, it essentially dies and comes away uh, from the underlying bone, probably because interruption of the microvascular supply to that bone. Eventually, because that bone is unstable underneath the articular cartilage, that that can ultimately come uh, through the articular cartilage and you have a loose fragment um, a, as a worst case scenario that can completely detach. The lateral aspect of the medial condyle of the femur is the most common site. About 75% of the of osteochondritis discans lesions. Again, we don't really understand why this happens. It must have something to do with uh, the microvascular supply, uh, etc., because it all tends to happen in the same place, and there must be something quite unique about that, but it's not entirely clear why it happens or who it happens in. Repetitive microtrauma can be a factor. Whether that ultimately then has a bigger impact when somebody has the beginnings of a development of an osteochondral defect that then potentially makes it worse because you've got more movement of that uh, fragment and that causes more damage to the cartilage and progresses it on to become worse, I don't know. But it is very much in keeping and very, very similar to osteonecrosis. I feel like it's all in that same path pathological bag um, with uh, uh, microvascular problems. More common in boys than in girls. Bilateral in about 10 or 20 percent of cases. It's, it's a really vague history and again it's not one that's really very easy to diagnose from a history or examination. It's something you just have to have a suspicion for and again have a really low threshold for doing an MRI scan on somebody. It's something that you see increased uh, uptake uh, behind it with inflammation within the subchondral bone, very clearly uh, showing what's going on even in the early stages. The worst case scenario is you ignore, 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 um, and don't do anything about it. And then ultimately you have a patient that comes in with a locked knee with a giant osteochondral fragment that then is not repairable. Um, and that's much more difficult to fill the giant crater that's left 
rather than trying to fix it while it's all in situ and you have intact articular cartilage over the top. So think about it early, investigate early so you can identify uh, the patients. Clearly, if somebody's got a loose body that's locking their knee, that's a pretty obvious sign. Here's an x-ray. And again, if you glance through this x-ray without the lovely well-placed arrows, which don't exist, unfortunately, in real life, um, you can see this obvious, very large um, outline of an osteochondral fragment uh, within that uh, uh, femoral condyle. You can see if you follow the line of the articular surface that it's not uh, breached or displaced, but is potential to leave a giant hole and a very significant problem for that person if that comes out. You need to determine whether the lesion is stable or unstable. You need to determine whether the articular cartilage over the top is intact. Restrict activities and weight bearing <coughs> for a period of time. And uh, it's, it manages their symptoms and allows for healing of the lesion over a period of 8 to 12 weeks. I'm not necessarily sure whether the restriction in activities and, and force through it encourage the healing of it. I think it's just that the blood supply reinvigorates itself. That bone then becomes... Uh, reintegrated and healed it's really to help with their symptoms and to prevent that potentially unstable fragment becoming more unstable uh, with impact activities and running about etc so it's a really difficult one and one that probably needs an interim mri scan just to check to see what's going on throughout that whole process rather than anticipating that it's getting better interestingly as an orthopedic surgeon i only ever tend to see the ones that are not getting better or are a problem or have fallen out or have locked but the majority of these will spontaneously heal, uh, particularly in kids with uh, open biases. The healing potential is, is massive, so it's, it's, that's the most likely outcome, which is fantastic. Once they're pain-free and there's x-ray or MRI evidence that it's healed, that's the point that you can let patients go, but always have it in the back of their mind <coughs> that, that this has happened and to be aware of it. Those that don't improve with conservative management or an MRI and x-rays are more unstable or they have synovial fluid sign where there's synovial fluid behind it which means the articular cartilage has been breached then there are surgical options including retro drilling so to try and again encourage um, the, the, the healing of that uh, gap or the damage to the bone by bringing in new blood supply and all the building blocks of, of healing or to stabilize it. So a bit like a fracture, the more movement you have between two bones, uh, the less likely it is to heal. And it goes from being uh, bone to bone that's, that's, that's filling in with callus to fibrous non-unions, um, or just that it doesn't heal at all with a, with a complete non-union. Um, you've got to give that stability. So this is one that I did uh, not that long ago, presented with significant pain, discomfort, locking. And we went in and you can see that that's almost the entire size of the articular surface of the medial femoral condyle. Uh, really very large fragment. The little black dots that you can see are tiny little compression screws that we've actually screwed that fragment back in. And it was so big that the, an the anterior, maybe one third of it is almost just cartilage and with no bone underneath. And so there was nothing to put a screw into or secure it. There are little chondral darts that we can get that are made of the same stuff that absorbable stitches are made from. They tend not to compress it very well. And what we did was we used a, a band of absorbable suture, almost a bit like a seatbelt, just to hold that down and give it as much stability as possible. Um, interesting, kids being kids and adolescents being adolescents, this chap that I was terribly worried about and hoping that this healed turned up to his six-week appointment on his skateboard, uh, fully weight-bearing without his brace, which I suppose is a good sign, but um, not something I really uh, would encourage. <laughs> So bipartite and multipartite patella, again, this is something that um, is a developmental thing. Normally your patella develops from one single ossification center, which means you have cartilage that then ultimately becomes bone. Sometimes you have two different ossification centers. The most common is that you have the main big patella and you've got this tiny little bit at the very top edge. And it's always just noticed incidentally on an x-ray and is of really no consequence whatsoever. It's very rare that it would be uh, symptomatic on its own probably after trauma more than anything else and it, it because it's there it's become uncomfortable almost universally is something that's conservatively managed 
very rarely needs uh, surgical fixation. I've only had one where somebody uh, came for surgical fixation because they had trauma and they ultimately had a, a not a fracture, but almost pulled apart uh, where it was a bipartite patella through that kind of fibrous union. And it took some screws to hold that back together again. And those two bits of bone healed back into one patella again. Talking about apply cuff. So this is really interesting. Embryologically, the knee develops from three separate compartments, uh, the medial lateral and the suprapatella. The plica are believed to be the remnants of those synovial compartments. So instead of being one separate one, um, one uh, being three separate ones, it becomes one main, and it's the, the remnants of the kind of divisions or the walls between those different things. And if they don't retreat and retract um, fully, then sometimes they can interfere with the mechanics of your knee or cause irritation and rubbing that can cause pain. Most, and I say most, are completely symptomatic and are completely irrelevant. And like I said, imaging is not really indicated, doesn't really help. You can't see a plica very well on an MRI scan. And if you can, you have no idea whether it's pathologic or not just from that. Um, really the only way, like I said before, that I'm aware that something might be causing a problem is when you're actually in doing an arthroscopy and you see it um, and how it interacts in the knee when you're bending and moving it. Um, again, it tends to be a situation that I've got a knee that somebody is in a lot of pain and discomfort. MRI scans look essentially normal. They're really struggling. It's really not settling. And the only option is to do something like a diagnostic arthroscopy. We go in and see a very large plica and trim and debride it. I've never really gone in to do that. It tends to be that it's something that's presented itself while I'm there. So I hope that has been useful. I know it's a bit of a super fast run through of lots of different things and we're kind of jumping around but it's an insight into specific things that are quite common topics and quite common things uh, within that population. And it's important to understand when it's really relevant to refer and when it's not and uh, what's, what's within normal limits. But the takeaway that I would give is that really if anybody has a patient with a significantly symptomatic knee and it's not getting better, please, please be very quick to get some form of imaging or an MRI scan uh, before continuing to treat somebody for an extended period of time, just in case it's something nasty, uh, which I have seen in the past. It's difficult through this medium. I've tried before <coughs> to look at YouTube while doing it uh, and try and answer some questions. Best thing I can do is that if you guys on my website or just use my email address which is mark at wessex-knee.com have any questions or any particular patients that you want to chat about or anything that's been discussed in this or you want a copy of the slides or anything at all uh, please just email me on that um, and I'd happily um, have a chat back so I hope that's useful I'll try and do another one of these again quite soon um, if you've got any suggestions of what you would like it to be on then feel free to let the guys know and I'll try and focus it for you. But I hope everybody has a nice evening and I'm really, really pleased that you've come and given me the time uh, to chat to you tonight. All right, thanks very much.